All right. Welcome, everybody. Wow. Is there anybody left in the town of Big Bay right now? <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Marty Ackett, and I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator for Peter White Public Library. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to Faye's uh, reading, which has been like two and a half or three months in the planning. So um, I just want to uh, thank a couple um, uh, groups that make events like this possible. One is the Friends of Peter White Public Library. Um, they provide all the live streaming equipment that we have. So if you're watching on YouTube now or after the fact, you can thank the Friends of Peter White Public Library for um, their support. Um, and I also want to thank my uh, cohort back there, Andrea Marsh, who's the communications coordinator and does such a really wonderful job getting all the, the advertisements out and promotions out for events like this as well. Um, so there's a few things that are um, upcoming um, for this week and next week that I want to make you aware of, if I can hold on to things. So tomorrow night, we are going to have a concert on the steps. The weather is supposed to be really, really nice. So um, we, I, I think it's going to be like 61 degrees at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. So we'll be out on the front street steps, and it's going to be Ethan Bott who's going to be performing. Um, and if you don't know Ethan, he's a really, really wonderful local country musician. Um, and um, he's a first for a con concert on the steps because I ha don't think we've had a country musician. Um, so um, I'm excited to have Ethan there. He's a really wonderful showman. Um, and then on um, Friday here at um, noon in the uh, community room, we're going to be doing our global cinema series. We're going to continue. And that is going to be the Italian film Cinema Paradiso. If you've never seen that movie, do yourself a favor. It's a really, really wonderful, wonderful film. Um, next week, see, I make these up and I can't remember what's going on. Um, next week, um, let's see, um, is Art Week. Um, so we've got lots of things going on for Art Week um, on Monday of Art Week. Yeah, for Monday of Art Week, we're going to be showing here in the, um, no, upstairs in the uh, Shiris room, we're going to be showing the film um, Girl with a Pearl Earring, um, which is about um, that Vermeer painting, Girl with a Pearl Earring. And then the following night, we're having an art historian, um, Ellen Longsworth, who's going to be doing a presentation about Vermeer, and she's also going to be talking about ekphrastic writing and ekphrasis when it comes to art. And if you don't know what ekphrasis is, it's when someone does or writes or does something that's inspired by another artwork. And uh, Ellen is going to be joined uh, during that presentation by her partner, um, John Smolens, who's going to be talking about um, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, the film, and also the novel that was based on that as well. So um, lots of great stuff there. On um, Wednesday of Art Week, um, we have a few things going on. Um, um, we have Passport to Home, okay? So let me explain this to you. Passport to Home is where you come to the library, you get this little passport, and then on Wednesday, it's the Art Stroll, uh, which is uh, through downtown Marquette, that's part of um, Art Week. And if you f we have clues on this passport. You go and you get your passport stamped um, for at five, no, six different places, um, and the clues are not that hard. I made them up, so it's not going to be that hard. Um, and if you get your passport stamped, you turn it in at the Daryl Syria Project concert on the steps on Wednesday night of next week. Um, we will draw a winner, and those winners will get some gift cards to um, places to get coffee and maybe snowbound books and everything. So um, passport to home um, and the Daryl Syria Project. Um, and then on next Thursday, see... You're getting all kinds of stuff. Next Thursday, we have um, the current Poet Laureate of the UP, um, Beverly Mathern, who's going to be leading a haiku writing workshop. Um, and that's going to be next Thursday, starting at, I believe, 1 p.m. Let me just make sure I'm not leading you wrong. There's too much on here. Uh, yeah, da, 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 Art Week. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> 
wow, you're, you, you, I better watch out. So you're going to be taking over my job. So lots of great things. And then next week, Friday, we also have um, a um, blockbusting cinema throwback here in the um, community room, which is going to be at noon. And that will be Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing um, on next Friday. If you've never seen that movie, um, do yourself a favor and show up. It's a really wonderful, powerful film. So I have all of this information um, on these two sheets, June and July events. And also, if you're interested in Concert on the Steps, there's just this that tells you when every single Concert on the Steps is happening. So um, let me do a little introduction to Faye here. Um, but she's probably going to be telling you a lot about herself anyway. Um, but, um, all right. Um, Faye is a native of the Upper Peninsula, um, and she went to um, Boston University where she got a BS in interdisciplinary studies, majoring in international relations and English. Um, she spent um, most of the majority of her career um, working for and writing for and editing for the Christian Science Monitor. I'm sure she'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but after she retired or easing into retirement, she came back and taught um, at uh, Northern Michigan University, taught journalism. She has a really, really um, impressive um, career in journalism. Um, and um, now she's um, back here in Big Bay. She just wrote this wonderful, wonderful book and published this wonderful, wonderful book about Big Bay. And um, so please give a warm welcome to Peter White Public Library to Faye Bowers. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for showing up here. Wow, I am just sort of overwhelmed by all this attention. So thanks, um, as Marty said. Um, well, it, thanks to Marty and the library for putting this together. I really appreciate it. And to you all for coming out. I'm going to spend just a little time talking about myself. And then I'll tell you more about the book and maybe read a few parts of the book. And then I'll open it up to your questions so I can maybe talk about more about what you want to hear than what I have to say because I've pretty much written it. So first a little about my background and how this storytelling all started for me. Um, I grew up here in the area, kind of between Marquette and Big Bay, and my parents did as well. Um, they both were moved here as little children. My father's family lived on, in Marquette, um, the, the children did anyway for a good period of time and went to school here. They lived on the corner of 7th and Ridge across the street from the cemetery while their father ran a lumber camp up in Big Bay. So they were, there were 14 kids in my dad's family and they were a pretty raucous kind of lumberjack crowd. A little bit coarse, a little bit rowdy and um, for my bridge fence here, they were vicious card players. <laughs> so you know where I come from. <laughs> my mother's family had moved to Birch and then Big Bay, and they were more on the quiet, reserved side, and they, the members of that family more worked in the mills than in the woods. And so um, I love the place. And what's not to love about here, right? When you, when you grow up here, except maybe the mosquitoes this time of year. But um, I'm, I'm new at working this, so I'm going to try to, yeah, it's going to work. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, as a young adult, I tried several vocations before I found what I really wanted to do. Um, I started out doing secretarial work, social work. And then I ran a flower shop in the desert southwest before I landed a job for a newspaper in Boston. And so it wasn't long after I arrived there that I realized this is what I really wanted to do. I could ask all the questions I wanted to and get paid for it. <laughs> and, and, it, and it was a wonderful education. Of course, there were rules. I had to learn how to report, how, learn how to interview, learn how to listen, which is one of the most important skills I would, would say for any storyteller. And I had to learn how to research and corroborate and corroborate and corroborate some more. So I was very happy to get this job. And um, it was kind of like continuing education for me, getting paid to go to school forever. And not long after I arrived in Boston, 
my mother, and I decided to do an old picture of my, my mother since this book is about the old days. Um, my mother came to Boston to visit me, and she, I took her, you know, showed her the historical sites, the Freedom Trail, Old North Church, all those things, and then I brought her to the newsroom where I work because I thought she'd be so impressed with this really bustling, high-tech, high-energy newsroom, and she sort of walked around and shrugged. So we left, and I said, well, Mom, what did you think? And she said, well, you know what? She said, it's the perfect job for you. You were born nosy. <laughs> And she's right. I grew up asking all kinds of questions and never stopped and listening to the adult conversations at night when I should have been in bed. And um, she knew me, <laughs> is what I could say. So it was, you know, my mother's stories and in, in her later years when she began to, her health began to deteriorate, she was really sharp still. So I spent more time coming home and talking with her and we would talk about the old days and, and I started working on family history then in earnest, but also would work with my other, her brothers and sister both lived in Big Bay. Her brother had retired from a job in California and moved to the family home in Big Bay. And he had amassed kind of a large collection of photos of, of my grandmother's, his mother's family, and documents. And one of the documents he had was this diary of my great uncle Pete. And Pete was kind of revered in the family. He, he was, he, he was a, a dedicated worker at the mill. He was a kind of renowned millwright that all of the owners of the mill sought out, including Henry Ford. His last job, he worked um, as superintendent of maintenance at all, of, all four of Henry Ford's UP plants. But he only had gone to the third grade. He had to quit school to go to work to help the family. And in 1923, he went on this trip to Alaska. And he drove a Model T Ford, a 1923 Model T Ford from Big Bay to Seattle and put it on a ferry and went to Alaska where he purchased blue foxes to bring back to Big Bay to raise. Now you can see from the diary, um, it's more like cryptic notes. He kind of says where he got to that day, where he ended up, what he had to eat, what he paid for, quote, eats. and. The dates are on there and the name of the month, I believe, or the day of the week and the date of the month, but no year. So at first I didn't know what year that, that he had made this trip. So this is a picture. Is Mr. Ludy here? He was going to come tonight, Dick Ludy. No, maybe not. This is a photo of Dick Ludy's restored 1923 Model T Ford. It is the model car that my uncle, great uncle, drove from Big Bay to um, Seattle. And I'm going to read you just a couple of parts from the book. I won't do this really long, but I think it's easier if I do this. Pete Raymond climbed into his new shiny black Model T Ford and left the little lakeside town of Big Bay, Michigan at daybreak on Thursday, the 21st of June in 1923. He stopped in Marquette for gas, which set him back a buck 18, and then struck out for Alaska. Pete had prepared well for this arduous cross-country trip, something akin to crossing the Atlantic in a kayak today. He carefully packed the Model T with assorted tools, camping equipment, and his shoelace-strapped scrapbook of maps and miscellaneous information he'd need to transport him through his 3,000-mile journey he also carried with him an ample supply of self-confidence, a marriage of raw curiosity, and, ex and successful work experiences that seamlessly melded with the economic boom of the post-World War 20s. And I'm just skipping around a bit to kind of give you a flavor and context of the time. At, at the time that he made this trip, it was still a full three decades before President Dwight D. Eisenhower began to champion an interstate highway system, and a full six decades before that network was completed. There were no decent road maps, or a chain of motels where one could place advance reservations, or regularly spaced service stations, 
or even a radio in the car for company. And I'm going to next show you a photo of the kind of map books. I kind of had to search these all out and just to back up for a minute to that diary. I, I didn't know what year it was until I decided to type it in because it was really hard to read and the spellings were really bad. I'll just back that up to show you that picture again. The, the spellings were really bad, like sometimes I could hardly decipher the names of the town. So I found some maps that were printed in 1920 and I brought some show and tell items and that map book is right there if any of you want to look at that after. Um, I got into August, I think, before I finally found a clue to the year. And it was Pete, when he arrived in Alaska, he bought a piece of property on Pennock Island, which is about a mile offshore of Ketchikan. And every few days, he, would, he had a motorboat that he would go over to Ketchikan to get the mail. And I think it was August 4th or 5th, something like that, he wrote in there that the post office is closed on account of the death of the president. So I thought, I finally have a clue to look up the year. So indeed, it was President Warren G. Harding had actually made a trip across the country that same year, had gone to Alaska, which was still a territory, and took a ship down to San Francisco and died in San Francisco on August 2nd, 1923. So I was able to nail down the year that way. So the other thing that I want to point out with this, the map book, is that look at how the directions are written there in mileage. So you have to know how many miles your car is going. In a 1923 Ford Model T wasn't equipped with a speedometer. So he bought one, it was called an aftermarket part at the time, and put it on the car. And so the next thing is a little bit of trouble that he had with that speedometer. Five days into his journey, after some 600 bumpy miles and hours of whistling all the tunes he could remember, it, quote, rained the hardest I ever saw, knocked down all the corn and grain alongside the roads, Pete wrote, and I could not get over the bad roads without chains. And then the speedometer began to run backward. <laughs> So he was really in a fix because if he wasn't having a correct speedometer, he could not follow these directions. So um, he traveled, um, let me see, he, he, pull, he, he, he was just west of uh, Fargo, North Dakota, I think, by this time. And he pulled into a place where he could stop and fix the car. He detached the speedometer cable from the left front wheel where it was incorrectly fastened, causing the speedometer to run backward, perhaps when he changed a flat tire. Then he reattached it to the right front wheel, which correctly engaged the speedometer to record forward moving mileage. The speedometer fix was vital for this trip. The directions in the automobile blue book from 1920 are provided in miles. For example, at 3.9 miles from Marquette, right-hand road, store on right, turn right. <laughs> Those are the kinds of directions it had. And then this next little part is, is the same night, just a little later after he had to like stop in the rain and repair this car. Uh, after he fixed the speedometer problem that Monday evening, Pete built the campfire and be began to prepare his evening meal, bacon and buns. Suddenly, he noticed he was no longer alone, and this really irritated him. Quote, this tourist park is no good, he writes in his journal. There is a driveway in a circle around the park, and all the nuts keep coming around looking at you as if they had a private zoo. And no one has come to camp yet but myself. <laughs> so, poor Pete. <laughs> he eventually made it to, to Seattle, and I won't tell you the whole story here, um, I think the middle of July. And then he booked passage on a steamship to Alaska, and he kind of went up and down the whole coast of Alaska before he got off near Valdez and then Ketchikan, and that's where he stayed for the entire winter. Um, Bought, bought land, built fox pens, and started buying these blue foxes, were, which were supposedly more valuable. The pelts were more valuable. And 
One more thing, just showing you on the trip. This is a toll bridge he had to cross. It was one of the first ones in the United States. It's between uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. And the old cars are traveling on that west from Wisconsin into Minnesota. And, and I, you know, I thought of the many things that he encountered on this trip. So many were firsts. He had never been out of Michigan number one. And he, you know, imagine encountering a toll bridge like this. So he had, his, he had quite, quite an adventure, I think. And this is a picture of Pete, the only one that I have of him in Alaska. He's, he, he's getting ready to come home. You can see the ticket to the train is pinned on his hat. <laughs> He's waiting at the train station in Vancouver to return home, and he put his foxes in crates, and they were on the train also. And this is a picture of those lovely blue foxes that he brought back at his home. He um, owned, I think, a two or three forties, kind of on the edge of Big Bay, right next to the cemetery. If some of you know where that is up there, and he had a fox farm that he ran for eight or ten years until, until the depression and did pretty well. So that's it with Pete. And, and I want to talk a little bit about, you know, journalism and, and writing and working on these stories. Um, it was the skills that I developed there and that I thought I would be done with when I retired, but these kinds of stories just called to me and I couldn't help like wanting to tell them. And when I, you know, when I started working on this, I began to interview all the older members who were still remaining in my family, my aunts and uncles who were left, and then all the other old timers around Big Bay as well. And I collected a huge amount of them, and then I started collecting photos, old photos of Big Bay as well. And then documents. My gosh, I went to the Library of Congress, to the National Archives, to the Ford Benson Research Center, and kind of all over. And so all of the material I amassed kind of presented this other collection of stories. And so I decided instead of writing a book just about Pete, I would do that as a short story and then do some of these other stories as well because there were so many people in Big Bay who were really ordinary people but they either did extraordinary things or they had extraordinary things happen to them. And this is a picture, and it's the only picture I can find. I wish I had one of the lady. This is Old Lady Lucy's house. And Old Lady Lucy is the only term I ever heard her called. Even in old newspaper interviews, people called her Old Lady Lucy. And she was the most feared woman in Big Bay. Rumor hat, you knew that Sharon back there is shaking her head. She knows. She, she, she was just scary, scary looking. And unfortunately, I cannot locate a photo of her. But she was scary looking and scary acting and mean. And rumor had it that she had murdered a man when this house was a speakeasy during Prohibition. And that she buried, there was a hump in the road, on the Big Bay Road. This is just south of what is now Cram Store. And that bump in the road, everybody said that man was buried under that bump. And we all believed it. <laughs> so we knew. But anyway, when I started researching her, her name was Rosanna Lucy. And she really, you know, kind of had an extraordinary life. She ran a speakeasy. Is that me? It might be your necklace. Let's take it off. <laughs> Never knew I'd do that here, right? <laughs> if not, we'll use the mic that Marty used. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's... Sorry about that, folks. So anyway, where was I? Rosanna Lucy. Um, in, in many of the interviews that I did, oh, especially I'm thinking of Jerry Bierman and my cousin Tuffer Temple, they had wonderful stories about Rosanna Lucy. So I started looking her up and I found some newspaper clippings that led me to some local um, court cases, which I was able to find. And so she was really pursued during prohibition. It, there were several people in Big Bay were, who were pursued in all around the country. I mean, it wasn't just a local thing. But she ran this speakeasy and the authorities were really out to get her. She was arrested four times by the state authorities and I guess they had some kind of rule. This is according to Russ Magnani who wrote a book about prohibition in the UP. 
he said that like once you're arrested the fourth time it went to federal charges so the last time she had a federal case and I was able actually Carol Poggi, you were to thanks for that. I had a hard time finding the records for that court case. I thought they might be here in Marquette, and Carol suggested I try Grand Rapids Court. They didn't have them, but they sent me to the National Archives in Chicago, who had the records of her court trial and imprisonment. She was probably the only woman in the UP who was sent to federal prison. She went to the first federal prison for women in the United States in 1929 and the prison only opened in 28 and she went to prison um, for three years for selling three glasses of 25 cent whiskey were the charges imagine today and and I'm just gonna read you a couple of things from that uh, The Mining Journal published news of the arrest on May 29, 1929, with a headline that proclaimed, Hell Hole of Big Bay Feels Sting of the Law. <laughs> it went on to discuss Lucy's arrest, as well as the arrests of five others, and said officers found at least a dozen drunks inside Lucy's house. <laughs> the, the article went on to quote Herring, the federal agent, as saying, I do not know a place in the Upper Peninsula in which the liquor situation has been worse than in Hungry Hollow. <laughs> Follow-up articles in the mine, Mining Journal called Rosanna Lucy the Queen of Hungry Hollow. <laughs> so the, uh, that, uh, that's one of my favorites actually, but you know, when I, when I look at this, at, at the stories, I go, oh my gosh, that, no, that one's my favorite. <laughs> This is, the, this is a picture of the document that was included in that file that the U.S. Marshal signed for her delivery to the federal penitentiary in, I think it was called Alderson, West Virginia. It's still there today. It's the same prison where Martha Stewart went and Squeaky Frome and Tokyo Rose and some other famous <laughs> women over the years. And then this is a photo of the Civilian Conservation Corps in Big Bay, which is another story I did um, in this book. Um, and here's a picture of the men. And I actually brought the original picture in down here. It's along the front there, if any of you want to look at it after. Um, you know, Big Bay was hit by the Depression just like the rest of the country after the 1929 stock market crash. And I think the Civilian Conservation Corps was the brainchild of FDR, who decided it was better to take young men and put them to work. And he let the young men keep $5 of their $25 monthly salary and sent the other 20 to the families of those young men to help support them during the Depression. And it was a hugely successful program. And you know, I found either written accounts or talked to many men who were there over the years, and these are pictures of some of them, including that's my dad on the far side. He was in there. And um, all of them speak so highly about the time that they spent there and the, the benefits that they reaped from, from that service, the skills that they learned um, to help them in careers throughout their lives. And this is my adorable older brother, Bert. <laughs> this is his eighth grade photo. While doing these interviews, I actually ran into a classmate of Bert's. Um, she is on the right in this little jail photo. That's Kitty Spihar Lahillier. And Kitty, I, I can't remember, I met her out somewhere with somebody, and she said to me, Bowers, your last name is Bowers, are you related to Bert? Which is what most women say to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, yes, and so she started telling me, she said, you know, I think I have an old picture of him at home, and did you know that we went on Powell Township School's first class trip together? And I said, no, I never heard the story. So 
this kind of happened with bouncing stories off Bert and then Kitty. And, you know, they, they kind of remembered the trip and parts of it and where they had gone, but they couldn't remember exactly when they went. You know, I was looking for, like, dates so I could look up a newspaper clipping or find something at the school or whatever. And finally, Bert one day remembered that they had been at a Detroit Tiger baseball game. And one of the players got cracked in the head with a baseball and knocked out. So I was able to Google that and found out the player's name was Hoot Evers. Indeed, they were there at that game, and I got the dates. And then the rest of the story kind of came together. But it started a tradition at Powell Township School that I think still carries to this day. Right, Linda? <laughs> and they, they took the eighth grade graduates as well as I think the some senior students who graduated from high school in Marquette but were from Big Bay went on this class trip and it was semi-sponsored by Henry Ford who had the mill in Big Bay at the time and they had a good time in Detroit. Unfortunately, I can't find an original of this photo but Kitty had this clipping of the class all dressed up visiting the Rotunda in Dearborn. And then the, one of the other stories I did is the kind of the history of, of, of the first family in Big Bay wrapped around the history of the town because they were so important. That is Maurice LeClaire on the left. He was a Native American who had, had camped at Squaw Beach. And on the right is Charlie Burns, the only photo that, I, that is known in existence of him. He is an Irish Scotsman who immigrated to the United States from Canada, came to Marquette, and then he went to Big Bay and married into the LeClaire family a few times. So the story's a little <laughs> bit convoluted, as is the history of Big Bay. And then, th this story is more personal to me because as well as relying on the memories of others, including and, and I have to just really call out my brother here and thank him. He, his memory is just, I double check everything with him because he has a long detailed memory of, of things going on in Big Bay. Anyway, this was my Uncle Docky on the left and he apparently drowned in Lake Superior at Black Rock Point in October 1939. And the story has been the subject of many long family discussions and stories. And so this story originates for me by those nights that I spent lying in bed listening to the older folks talk out in the kitchen. And I couldn't tell the story of Uncle Docky without including my Aunt Belle, who was probably my dad's favorite, but he listened to her for everything, for financial advice. If one of us kids were sick, it was her. She called to take care of us, and she had this larger-than-life personality. She, she was an amazing woman. <laughs> told the greatest ghost stories. She um, tried different religions as, as trying on different clothes. She dabbled in spiritualism, seances, and ghost stories. And I mean, it was just fun as a kid to listen to all this stuff. But one was her suppositions about what really happened to my uncle. And no body was ever found. So, you know, people still speculate to this day, and it's a good story. But... Um, that, that is Belle there with two of, her si two of her sisters and my dad. And I'm going to just take the time to tell you kind of one funny story that didn't make it into the book about Belle, but it kind of encapsulates her personality. I think it was about like every spring, J.C. Penney's has an underwear sale. <laughs> and Belle was the only one of the sisters who drove. So she would pick up Gertie and Lou and take them downtown Marquette from Big Bay to buy new underwear. And she parked on South Front just below Washington and they walked up by in front of, used to be the First National Bank there on the corner and over to J.C. Penney's and she slipped on the ice and fell flat on her back. So some nice man in a suit came over to help her and he said, oh my goodness, you poor thing, are you okay? Do you need some help? And she looked up at him and said, excuse my coarse language, but I can't tell this without talking like Aunt Belwyn. No, you silly son of a bitch. I lie down here every afternoon at four just to watch the feet go by.
<laughs> so, that's her. And so the other thing I want to quickly tell you about before I go to your questions is, when I collected all these photos of Big Bay, I was looking for an outlet. Lots of people would call me for copies. So I started this Facebook page called Big Bay's Bygone Days. And many other people, like Emmy and Linda Fleury, have donated their pictures to this as well. So there are tons of old Big Bay pictures in here, and they're, they're sorted by albums by either decade or subject. And any of you who are interested in that are welcome to take a look. And with that, I'm going to throw it to you all for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Nina. Well, that's where they kind of considered Hungry Hollow started, just past Cram's store. So it was just beyond the store. Um, if I go back to that photo, pardon me? Yeah, the apple orchard was out front, and I kind of show it here. So, you know, before it was Cram's store, it was Temple's. And this, these, these photos were actually taken when Temple's store burned down. I got these from Tuffer. And, but they showed the house, her old woody station wagon in the yard. And in that one, you can see the apple orchard out by the road there. Where what? Behind that now, right? Yeah. What happened to her after prison? I, you know, she came back to Big Bay. They, they, they stayed in that house until they both died in the, I, I can't remember, one died in the early 60s and one died in the later 60s. But they, they were very reclusive. No one ever went in their house. They were, and, and it sort of, you know, when I learned about the prison stint, it sort of explained why they were the way they were. Yes? Uh, in all your research, what was the biggest surprise or learning that you came across? Oh, gosh. You know, well, one was in the Lucy story, and, and it, it was how, how different worlds operated. You know, Lewis Kaufman owned Granite Loma Farms up there, and one of the things I read about him is he bought an entire liquor store on the west side of Manhattan and brought it up to his place by train, and he had a vault in the lodge there where they kept all the liquor, and they... They entertained movie stars and book writers and all sorts of people um, lavishly and never paid any penalty for that during Prohibition. And yet Mrs. Lucy went to prison for selling three twenty-five cent glasses of moonshine. That was a big surprise. <laughs> Adana. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Often, you know, I probably worked on it off and on for 20 some years because I started before I quit work, before I retired. And it's kind of when I got the diary and all that stuff and interviewed a lot of the old timers. And then after I first retired, I didn't really want to work anymore. But then, <laughs> then I thought I really had to do something with this stuff. So I finally did. So it's been off and on. I work, I work in fits and starts. <laughs> Me, me? Well, that's not true. In, in here, <laughs> it's not true. Uh, and one more thing I'm going to show you then, and, and I put this on here just in case. Uh, yeah, I, I received the diaries of Geneva McKenzie, who is known as Ma McKenzie in Big Bay. She was the company nurse from about 1920 to the early 50s. And she kept diaries for 15 years that I have, as well as letters. She had four sons, and all four sons were in World War II at the same time in different theaters. And she was an incredible woman. So I have her diaries and letters, and I'm, I'm processing those now. So maybe, thank you, thank you. Any other questions? It was, you, it was about three miles south of Big Bay. Do you know where, um, what is that road called that went to Crocker and Crams and Mattis's Road, we always called it? It's on the other side of the road there. There's nothing there now. 
Yeah, Joe. What happened to Pete's car? He, he, he sold it in Alaska for more than he paid for it. <laughs> he was a businessman. <laughs> He came back by train. But then the car no, he sold the car in Alaska, and it sta the car stayed there. Oh, that's a different. It, it is just the same model of car that he drove. Okay. I think so. I, I don't have really good records. There, there were some records in the back of this, this diary that he sold. There were two other fox farms that started off his, the chaperones and Tompkins, I think. And they bought foxes from him, but he talked about selling the pelts, and you know, I think he got good money for them. But it, you know, then the Depression, it, there was a huge demand for fox pelts back then because all the women in New York, the, well, I can't remember what you called the, the Fox stoles, the flappers. Thank you. I couldn't think of that word. But they, they had fox stoles. And so it was a big thing during the Roaring Twenties. There was a huge demand. The price of the pelts more than quadrupled during the years that he went to get them. Yeah, kind of bluish black, I think. From what I can tell, I mean, I never saw one. <laughs> but only pictures of them. Did you ever see one, Bert? At one of the foxes, did you were were did he ever have any foxes when you were alive? Okay. Right, right. Okay, Tammy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's how they did it. And they actually got one of the Burns, Johnny Burns, went with, they paid Johnny Burns to go with them into her house to buy liquor. Yeah, it was kind of nasty. Carly. The relationship between themselves and like people from the here at Mountain Club, like that dynamic. Does anybody ever express anything? Because I'm just curious as like what it was like then as to as it is now. Yeah. It seems like such a separate entity from what's really going on up there. Like was it like that back then? I think so. I, you know, I, I didn't talk to lots of people about it much. Most, most of the conversations had to do with Henry Ford coming there and what he did because he was a member of the club. But I think it was very separate. Many women in town work there as domestics and other people, but I, I didn't really talk a lot about that to anybody. No. Sharon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anybody else? No? Okay, there are a few books. I know lots of you already have books, but there are books back there. And there, there are a few of my brothers also. He published a book in 2009 about his memories of the big lakes. So there's that one as well. And I kind of wish we had a big table or bar. We'd pull up and have a party and just really talk. <laughs> thank, thank you all for coming out. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs>